that's wise. So I'm saying to see you're not in your office, Ben. You're yeah, so I'm I'm in my office about three times a week. Uh, so I try to alternate and uh, but you look like you have a piano there. <laughs> yes. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> what are you working on? Uh, on the piano? On the piano? Or... Yeah. No, I'm not working on the piano. That's my daughter's oh. piano. So uh, okay. Uh, okay. like in your case, uh, this is sort of a... But Hagen is a pianist. Hagen's uh, a pianist really he's well. He has a piano in the background, but he's currently traveling. So he has to do with a pipe. Yeah. But I, I never told you guys that it's not a real piano. It's just a white board with a photo on a, of a piano. Oh, I heard you play. I heard you play. <laughs> it's actually real and you play very well too. Okay, I'm going to start admitting people. Okay. There we go. Lots of people. Maybe I'll put up the slides so that people know they're in the right place. So Gilad, yeah, the technical question. Um, you still only see uh, Peter's slide, not my additional window here. Do you? I see. Um, I see um, yeah, uh, no. your slide, uh, uh, Ben. Yeah, the, the the webinar slide, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, you don't see my, for instance, my Mathematica window that I have open here. I don't see oh, that. Actually, yeah, to open that. Maybe there's something interesting. <laughs> there's lots of interesting things. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure that you see the right thing. Peter, I see you with a bunch of grapes, is what I see. Bunch of grapes? I don't know. Yeah, what that it, would mean. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a model of a protein, but it looks like it looks like you're there. Crushing grapes like in an old fashioned. I have no idea what that could be. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have any special screensaver. Maybe you're seeing the picture of my grandmother. Uh, on the... it has nothing to do with. Uh... Yilad, is, is, it, is it perchance, is, is that a, uh, uh, a graphic that you just chose to advertise it's Peter's talk? That we show in the beginning of every lecture. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, Peter, I was going to say, I don't think my grandmother, that's the only thing you can see behind me if, is this old picture of my grandmother when she was about 20 or so, I guess. And what's freaky about it is my daughter, uh, just which like I didn't find this picture till my, my sister died about uh, 10 years ago. And, wow. and my daughter, uh, uh, it looks ex almost exactly the same. It's like one of these weird... Um, uh, you know, things like you see in horror movies where you ah. look at the portrait and it's exactly someone now. Ah. Very ah. strange. I, I think there's something about genetics in that, Peter. Yeah, yeah, I think maybe, 
maybe maybe there's maybe there's some way information is transferred from one generation to the other or something. Who knows? Yeah. 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 Hey, David, it seems like we need to start the lecture. Okay. So Ben, uh, yeah. Okay, so then I think we should start. Welcome all of you to our webinar on protein folding and dynamics. It's wonderful to see so many of you again and uh, that so many of you attend our series of talks, which as you probably know, we started a few months ago to help us bridge this time where we all cannot go to conferences, where we cannot meet in person to discuss science. However, before we start with today's talk, I would like to spend a few moments in memory of a, an eminent protein scientist, Harold Chiraga. And as many of you already know, Harold passed away on August 1st, the age of 98. And you see him here on the left in 1947, just after arriving at Cornell. And on the right in a very recent picture, also at Cornell, Harold was a professor at Cornell for 70 years. Remarkably, these two pictures essentially span the entire history of the field of modern protein chemistry. And there is probably nobody among us who has not been influenced by Harold's work. When he started his career, proteins were still a complete mystery, um, but that changed quickly in the following decades. And to a large degree, um, that was owing to Harold's work, who pioneered the application of physical chemistry to proteins. And of course, these contributions were essential for establishing the entire field of, of protein biophysics as we know it today. So Harold will be deeply missed and our thoughts go out to his family and friends and colleagues. But his legacy will of course live on and uh, especially since he's one of the giants on whose shoulders we're standing today. Now, our field has developed enormously thanks to giants like Harold. And in our previous lectures in this webinar series, we've already seen impressive examples of work from leaders in the field that illustrate exactly that. And uh, today we continue our series with uh, an outstanding leader in the field, Peter Wallinus. So thank you very much, Peter, for agreeing to speak here today. It's a true pleasure to have you with us. No, thank well, you. It's, it's very difficult to do Peter's full oeuvre justice in a, in a short introduction. Uh, most of you will know Peter for introducing key ideas from statistical mechanics into protein folding, especially the idea of energy landscapes that look like rugged funnels. And it's an idea that Peter has used extremely successfully, for instance, for describing and explaining protein folding kinetics and also for structure prediction. But he did not stop at establishing the foundation of protein folding. He also introduced many other new concepts to protein function and dynamics. Uh, for example, the, the relation between frustration and function uh, or mechanisms of ballastery, such as, as cracking, as he calls it, or protein misfolding and amyloid formation. And some of this we'll probably hear about today. Also, fly casting is a mechanism for protein interactions that involve disordered proteins. And it's actually something that we come, come across all the time in our experimental work on IDPs. Now, his work on proteins is, is part of a much broader research program in Peter's group where he uses the ideas of energy landscapes, not only in biology, but also in chemistry and physics. And that the topics range from glasses and supercooled liquids, including quantum effects, all the way to 3D structures and dynamics of chromosomes in the cell nucleus. Peter is currently the Bullet Welsh Foundation Professor of Science at Rice University and co-director of the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics and the great influence that his work has had is of course reflected by a long list of awards and memberships in many academies of science worldwide. 
And I will not list them here because I really don't want to take more of your time. And because we're all very curious about what you will tell us about today in your talk titled Protein Dynamics and the Brain. Now, just a few technical points before we start. I would like to ask everyone to please keep your microphones muted to minimize background noise. If you have a question, please use the chat window that you can activate in Zoom. Uh, and either write down your question or simply write, I have a question or the like, and then we will call you in the end, ask you to unmute your microphone, and then you can ask your question in person. And a big advantage of this webinar format is that we do not have to stick to a detailed schedule. So we should be able to address all your questions. After all, this is one of the reasons why we started this webinar to be able to discuss. I would also like to mention that this talk will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel so that people who missed the talk can watch it later on. It turns out actually some of these talks have now been watched more than a thousand times. But now, Peter, without any further ado, thanks very much again for joining us. We're very much looking forward to your talk. The screen is yours. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I hope uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be able to give this talk or try to give this talk more properly. Uh, I've, I've been uh, attending these uh, seminars uh, on the web, and I guess I've learned uh, they've been very fun, and I've learned how, uh, how to listen to such a seminar. But this is the first time I'm giving a, a, a web-based seminar, so uh, uh, bear with me. Almost always when I give a normal seminar, something goes wrong. So I think uh, I'm hoping that that will not be the case uh, here. Um, I think uh, Ben would tell me that I should do the uh, share screen function at this point. Yes. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so let me share the screen and let me go to the PowerPoint. Um, and... Hang on, we cannot see your screen yet. You Maybe. can't see my screen yet. Okay, so now I do. Yes. Does that look better? That's good. Okay, yes. and then I'll minimize everyone. And I think I can go backwards. Um, so um, yes, I'm going to talk about protein dynamics in the brain. Now, chemistry, probably the basic theme of chemistry is that things change. Um, the theme of biology, I think, looked at from the chemical point of view, uh, is it's the first place in the natural world where information enters, meaningful information. I guess one could say entropy always deals in some sense with information, but in biology, we start to find meaningful information that's various and complicated and that needs to be remembered from uh, uh, not only in the life of a single cell, but as the life propagates itself from generation to generation. Uh, I think everyone uh, knows that the original uh, discovery of uh, DNA was uh, met with uh, great excitement because when the structure of the molecule of DNA was uh, seen, it was clear how information could be transferred from one way anyway, information could be transferred from one generation to the next. When proteins enter the story, we find many more complicated ways in which information is uh, dealt with in biology. We have all kinds of nonlinear interactions of uh, uh, signals. Uh, we have allosteric. Um, and uh, and uh, this is why I would say there's been a new sort of branch of statistical mechanics that's had to deal with the uh, understanding of information-rich systems. Now, of course, proteins and biology are not the only place we have information-rich systems. We also have them in computer science, and we also have them in neuroscience. Uh, and so I've always kept an eye out on neuroscience uh, through my uh, interest in, bi in uh, uh, protein uh, folding and protein dynamics. And uh, recently, uh, I uh, started to see some places in this where, uh, through collaborations with colleagues, uh, where some of the big ideas that we've learned in protein folding and the ideas that follow from that about how proteins uh, do their functions can uh, provide some key links in understanding some of the uh, functions of the brain. I would say still this area is uh, uh, nowhere near as um, uh, 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 understood as, as uh, structural molecular biology. What we are now seeing in is a sort of combination of mysteries, but some of the mysteries are ones that protein dynamics can at least help us uh, deal with. 
Now, uh, in fact, the key uh, uh, issue that's going, that enters into much of the thinking about the brain uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, has to do with preserving information and memory. And of course, this is a famous quote from the uh, book of Marcel Proust, which I haven't read, uh, but it's his famous book, In Search of Lost Time. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and in this, he recounts this very odd and somewhat uh, a spontaneous uh, uh, occurrence of memory event. He talks about eating some uh, tea mixed with breadcrumbs or cookie crumbs, the madeleine. Uh, and then as soon as he ate it, a whole bunch of other associations uh, came to his mind. He started to think about his grandmother and what her bedroom looked like and so on. Uh, so it seems that this sort of processing of information uh, is certainly very complex. How do you have a, um, a, uh, a, a per, uh, something that you eat uh, remind you of your grandmother? They're both very, very complicated. Uh, but there are many simpler examples of memory uh, that we can see in uh, uh, different organisms. So for example, there's a sea snail called a plesia that it learns that whenever it gets a certain bad uh, chemical taste uh, that it will be uh, have its gills um, uh, uh, dealt with in a bad way. And so whenever you give it that, that flavor, it remembers to crunch itself up and do something. So they're very simple events uh, that are much simpler than remembering your grandmother. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and these are the ones that have started to form the sort of uh, uh, substructure of understanding uh, uh, memory, uh, both in humans and in, the, and in, and, and in other animals. Now, uh, this uh, learning goes on in a, uh, in a uh, they, they've been able to uh, localize where the learning probably goes on. Uh, it goes on in the, sol in the uh, uh, synapses of neurons. So neurons are these odd looking uh, uh, cells that have a cell body. The cell body has lots of long tendrils going up it called dendrites. Off of these dendrites are indeed even smaller uh, objects called dendritic spines. Um, and these dendritic spines uh, make contact with the tendrils, uh, with the axons that come from other um, uh, neur neurons. And they're the sort of gatekeepers of information flow. So one of the main ideas about how memories are formed is an idea to a psychologist, a physiologist named Hebb, uh, who said that, well, what happens is when the same neural connection is uh, probed at the same time, and if this happens uh, repeatedly, that same neural connection grows. It's a little like uh, if you exercise your muscles, you do your exercises better. In fact, there is an element of doing exercises, which is probably this neural uh, associative learning. So in this way, if you always find that two neurons are going off at the same time, they'll both get connections, those connections will be strengthened, and that way that pattern of T grandma come together. Now, of course, people argue about whether you have a grandmother cell. There probably are many more layers of information processing to describe this. But in the case of that sea snail, uh, the aplesia, we sort of know which uh, neurons connect with which almost. Now, this neural signal uh, is uh, sent uh, uh, along the neurons through a complex process that involves proteins, opening and closing of membrane proteins. Uh, and uh, that's why you're able to transmit things, not just by uh, resistance of the cable, but you have a propagating wave. Um, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, but, but then this, this jumping over to the other cell goes uh, uh, by the diffusion of chemicals or by an electrical signal. And this electrical signal uh, causes one of these uh, spines, this little globule that's sitting on the uh, off of the uh, uh, off of the dendrite uh, causes it to change when an electrical signal of the right type enters it. Here, this is done not by waiting for an electrical signal to come in from a cookie, but it's done by a photochemical process. And what's happened is calcium has been released, and then you see that after the calcium is released, uh, the dendritic spine has grown. 
By growing, it now has the opportunity to add, for example, some more receptors, and therefore it will have a stronger interaction. So in this way, things from the past get preserved in the structure of the dendritic spine and tell that spine to be whatever size it happens to be. Um, now, in fact, there's a lot of complexity in that in the, in the real system because you really respond not to direct signals, but to oscillating signals. And there's a lot of uh, complicated system biology going on there, which uh, I don't know about. Uh, and also I'm not sure anyone really knows completely about, but there's a lot, uh, lot going on just to get to this stage of releasing calcium. Um, so when the calcium is released, you have originally actin fibers in this uh, dendritic spine. They seem to be organized in a, a, fair, in a fairly simple way. They're kind of long uh, uh, molecules that look like, uh, well, they're really collections of molecules, uh, huge long fibers like the fibers in your feather pillow. Um, and then when the calcium comes in, uh, somehow or other, this dendritic spine rearranges. You start to get things with branches and so on and so forth. Uh, and that pushes outward. And then the dendritic spine grows. And then it goes back to being stable. So the analogy I like to use for this uh, is it's very much like if you have a feather pillow. I don't know how many of you still have those or whether you have only plastic pillows. But a feather pillow, when you put your head into it, it scrunches down. It's very malleable. It scrunches down to a certain shape. And when you get your head off of the pillow, that shape is still there. Nevertheless, it's not as solid as a crystal where you couldn't do much with it at that point. Instead, you can fluff it up and go back again and keep trying. And so these dendritic spines are like the sort of feather pillows of your, of, of, of your memory. Um, now, one of the key molecules that takes the calcium and turns it into uh, the change of the actin skeleton is thought to be uh, a, a molecule called uh, calmodulin-dependent kinase. Now the calcium actually binds with calmodulin and this calmodulin then, uh, uh, then is what acts to activate the kinase and uh, causes it both to do some phosphorylation processing, which is involved in, the, uh, in, in this problem of how do you uh, take uh, frequency dependent signals and rectify them. Uh, but also one of the things is the calmodulin Kinase, dependent kinase, CAMK2, so I don't have to say it so many times. Uh, CAMK2 binds with the actin and is, a, is an element uh, of this actin uh, network. In fact, it's present in an amount not too different, uh, only a, 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 a maybe about 5% or something of the total number of actin. Uh, and it forms uh, things which in the basal state often are uh, aligned uh, in this fashion, uh, giving you a little. Um, uh, uh, triangular assemblies, but also it can form very nice uh, parallel assemblies, as we'll see. And then what happens is the calmodulin comes in, chemkinase is uh, dissociated uh, from the actin, and now things can happen and you can rearrange uh, and lead to uh, a change of the network structure. And this is actually the uh, problem that protein dynamics enter into. What is the protein dynamics involved in calmodulin? reorganizing this huge uh, network through the signal of a small ion of calcium coming in. After it's over, it has to be stable, but obviously this has to be somehow regulatable. And that's something where understanding uh, protein dynamics enters. As I said, there's a large number of other actors here, and it's very possible uh, that, uh, that uh, there are many, many key components left out in the little story or fable uh, that I told you, not only it, it, is it probable, I would say it's, uh, is it possible, it's probable. Uh, so there's really a huge number of proteins that are involved in setting up the actin uh, cytoskeleton. And we're going to have, I think, some a uh, lot of work to understand all of their dynamics and how that is involved in this actin remodeling. But this is, the, this is a step in that direction. Now, <clears throat> Yeah, this sounds super complicated. How can protein dynamics in its current state help us to look at this problem? Well, there's actually two levels. One is that in a certain way, uh, the, the way we've been thinking about protein structure prediction and so on for many years has had a large connection to neurobiology. Uh, starting, uh, I guess it's uh, getting to be 30 years ago or more uh, uh, with this analogy between a neural network that learns things by association 
and the idea that proteins somehow have encoded in their sequence a certain structure, uh, uh, we embarked and others have embarked on a procedure that used many ideas from landscape theory combined with the ideas how landscapes uh, inform neural network thinking uh, to develop energy functions for folding proteins. There's a sort of the opposite of viewpoint of, I would say, uh, well, people like Harold Chiraga, who you heard about at the beginning, who wanted to build things from the bottom up. In this way, if we try to learn from example, we're building from the top down. And so it's kind of an example of machine learning. Now, this has been actually a relatively successful enterprise. There's all sorts of other ways of doing it now. Um, I think uh, protein structures of small, uh, smaller proteins are really uh, quite well under control by following the dynamics of these uh, 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 machine learned uh, energy functions. And uh, in our particular brand of it, uh, also the process of learning how to do things like this has taught us many things like that there's all kinds of interactions that we didn't think about before. The famous hydrophobic effect was known for a long time, but, uh, but work with Garrick Papoyan about, oh, I guess it's gonna be about 15 years ago, uh, taught us that there were all kinds of other interactions that are involved in forming wet interfaces where the water mediates the interactions. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, over the years, we've been able to develop a, a, a tool which allows us to study uh, folding of protein molecules, predicting their structure, looking at their mechanisms. Uh, but especially for this talk, what's relevant is that we're able to predict uh, structures of dimers. We can do it especially well if we know the structures of the independent monomers. So there's a kind of complex docking procedure where both proteins uh, uh, form themselves up and also try to figure out where they're supposed to go. Uh, and these are examples of uh, predictions of dimer structures uh, oh, from about, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's about 10, 10 years ago now, almost. Uh, maybe less, maybe six years, six or eight years ago. Um, and um, and this, these molecules that we're talking about in the chemkinase active thing are very, very large. Uh, we certainly could not simulate their motion from scratch with an associate memory Hamiltonian uh, today and just expect those, those uh, nice assemblies to form up. Uh, but uh, we can, by using also some experimental information, uh, combine it with our ability now to do structure predictions of how things associate with each other to try to see how uh, those chem kinase actin assemblies uh, might be built up from scratch. And of course, in doing it, uh, we're not going to be um, uh, uh, ignorant of, uh, you know, other information that comes in from direct experimental uh, determination. So we'll use all the tools at our disposal to try to figure out what's a structural chem kinase act in assembly and how it might work. So first of all, one big part of the kinase is the part that does the, the uh, uh, enzymatic activity. Its structure actually is known. John Currian has figured it out uh, by X-ray crystallography, and it has a six-fold symmetry. There have this six-fold so-called hub. Now connected to that hub though are, is a long linker which is uh, uh, disordered um, and the linker and as well as another domain called the association domain. These domains are actually essential for giving very strong binding to actin even though the kinase itself can bind somewhat to actin on its own. Um, so, uh, so we have a, a part that is a very well-defined structure already known that's going to bind to actin and then we have other parts whose structure individually we don't know because they're, uh, they're disordered. I always uh, have to hesitate. I, I almost say intrinsically disordered as many people do, but I suspect that Jose is listening and I know it always makes him upset when someone says intrinsically disordered. Uh, actually, he, he, he always complains when I say that, but it's okay um, for now. He'll, he'll complain afterwards. Um, now, in looking at this, uh, one of the ways we got into this problem um, uh, was that, um, uh, as you'll see, actually, this is a collaboration with uh, Margaret Chung uh, and, uh, and an experimental group, Neil Waxham. Uh, we had also gotten into the neurobiology problem uh, through a different side from, uh, from folding, looking at aggregation. I'll get to that at the end. Uh, the uh, student who had worked on that, who will come up later, Ming Chen, uh, yeah, also uh, got interested in this and began to 
uh, do uh, surveys of structures. And actually lots of actin binding structures are known. Uh, and in, uh, in many of these structures, not in all of them, 80% of them, uh, it turns out that the, act, that the proteins that remodel actin all bind to a very certain cleft uh, in the actin, which you see uh, circled below. Um, so one has a kind of idea of where the action might be. And as I said, in our current uh, stage of simulation, any information you have uh, th that you could use to guide the molecular dynamic simulation helps a lot. So uh, uh, Margaret and uh, Chan Wang, uh, who was uh, one of her students, and Ming Chen and, and, uh, and, and I, uh, started to look at this problem, build things up. Oh, sorry, let me go. I hope this goes back. Um, yeah, uh, and here, the where you start is just to look at the actin structure. Of course, it's very, very big, but we can take out a region where we think the binding cleft might be. We can look at the cam kinase mo uh, monomer, and then we can see with some, hmm, okay. Sorry. I'm going to see if my movie can start. This should start up. Hmm. I did nothing. This should show a binding event. Yes, it's a little bit fast. And you can see that with some general uh, direction towards this uh, site, one can get an idea of where the binding is. And in fact, if our binding from our previous uh, studies, if we're even that accurate, we uh, should have a good idea. And in fact, uh, we, we can check uh, what the structure is. This is a structure that's predicted. Uh, and now this is a cryo-EM picture by Neil Waxham. And you can see that the hexagon sort of fits in about the, in about the location we thought it would. And uh, one of the key ingredients of this structure is that there's a kind of angle uh, between the hub and the actin. It's a small angle of five uh, to 10 degrees. And it reason reasonably matches up with the cryo-EM. This is obviously not atomic resolution uh, cryo-EM that I'm showing you though. So because of this angle, uh, we can bind uh, cam kinase particles uh, many, many places along an actin fiber. Um, many of these places, of course, if you bind at the next uh, uh, residue down, you can't do it because you're already blocked. And this is also with the, the, where the hub domain is. Um, the actin fiber is a helix, so it's made of all the same things. It has to repeat like a helix. There's that five degree offset. When you combine these things, uh, um, uh, uh, Chan saw that uh, there would form a periodic, uh, it'd be very nice if you could form a periodic structure uh, where the cam kinases were in uh, equivalent positions and the spacing would be 36 nanometers. These would now be all in the same plane. And so now if another actin fiber comes up, it can form a linear parallel bundle. If, a, if an actin is somewhere else on the side, it will form a junction. So this suggests that you get bundles of actin cam kinase. That will be a common uh, structural theme. Uh, and you could then build these bundles up into just parallel planes, or you could offset them a bit, and then they would form tubes. And in fact, these are, again, structures which are seen uh, in the electron microscope uh, by Neil uh, Waxham and his people. Now, as I said, part, there are other parts of the protein that matter in the binding. Uh, the binding constant when you cut off the regulatory domain, linker and association domain is much smaller than, um, uh, than it should be, or the binding free energy is smaller. So one tries to figure out which parts of those domains might be playing a role experimentally. And one way to do that is to cut up the, the uh, cam kinase played out peptides of length, I think about 15 to 20 in length, I've forgotten exactly, uh, and, um, uh, and plate them out onto a plate here. And now pour actin fluorescently on top and see where things bind. And uh, uh, when you do that, uh, one can analyze which places uh, bind uh, uh, well, which ones don't. This is one way of uh, looking at the data. Uh, at this stage of the process, uh, Nick Schaefer added uh, a, a lot into our story. And uh, he was involved in setting up the analysis of these things as well as further studies that uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk about later. Um, 
And this gives you, again, some possibilities in these disordered regions of the regions that bind. And you could see that if these regions combine in addition to what's going on in the catalytic domain, uh, then this would be a way to increase the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, binding constant. Uh, so we started to simulate just those novel parts and how they uh, bind, again, using the awesome Hamiltonian. This is an example of a movie of what you get and gives you candidate places where things bind. You can take all these things uh, with no bias. You can then screen them by those experimental results uh, to see which ones would correspond to the regions that are shown as strong peptide binding. And then this gives us the model that you see here. Um, and uh, what you see is that the, uh, you actually involve something like five of the actins in a row. So this is a really huge system to simulate. Uh, we can do it, do it much faster now than we could when we first did this a uh, year and a half ago. Uh, and you can see that the regulatory domain and the linker uh, associate with actins further down, uh, away from the, um, away from the, the, the hub molecule. So what can we learn from this uh, structure? Well, first of all, we can uh, see that uh, why these extra parts increase the, uh, the, uh, the binding. Uh, and we can also see how they can be regulated. Um, each one, you need each of them together in order to give the full binding. If the regulatory domain falls off, then you're left with a weaker binding. Uh, and uh, so one can, by interacting with the regulatory domain, you can uh, change the um, uh, affinity uh, for actin. So again, with awesome, we can calculate free energy profiles. This is more or less the same kind of thing we've done for looking at fly casting uh, before uh, and in many other problems. And uh, we can calculate in this way the binding constants. Only about two kilocalories are coming from that uh, regulatory domain, four from this uh, linker, and four, a little less than four, uh, from the CAM kinase, uh, the kinase part of the CAM. It's all CAM kinase. Um, so how does the Kalmadial enter the story? Well, stimulus, calcium concentration raises, the Kalmadulin becomes activated. The Kalmadulin turns out it binds and has been known to bind with this regulatory uh, framework, uh, 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 segment. And uh, 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 and, uh, and, that, and in fact, it binds in such a way that is incompatible with the, um, uh, with the binding of that regulatory segment to the actin. It goes to the same region. Uh, here. You can't bind both at the same time. So we have a mechanism, uh, we have a possibility of a mechanism like molecular stripping, that when part of the molecule comes off, it may be, that it, because it's bound only fairly weakly for a, a moment, then another molecule comes in, binds to it, now prevents the further, uh, the, the rebinding. Um, and uh, uh, this is a mechanism that uh, Betsy Komovess uh, discovered in uh, an F kappa B, e, I kappa B system. Um, so once the calmodulin comes in, uh, it, it rips off the small part of the binder. And then after doing so, the rest of it can fall off. And that's what allows us to have a regulatable uh, binding. But now uh, later, uh, the, the uh, uh, calmodulin can come off itself. Uh, and now we can rearrange and get a new structure for the, for the, uh, uh, the feather pillow of the dendritic spine. So, uh, so these are the kind of events that uh, start memories. Uh, another part of the story, one which actually uh, I got into before we uh, collaborated with Margaret, uh, is, uh, is the problem of how do memories last so long, like from childhood till uh, adulthood? Uh, most of the proteins uh, uh, last only uh, an hour or so in, mo in most uh, uh, cells. Of course, there are some proteins that last longer, like the crystalline in your eyes. Those have always formed assemblies. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the questions is, how can this assembly that's made of actin you know, screwing around and doing all this stuff, how can it be there for you know, decades? 
so this problem of memory and molecular turnover was noticed by very smart people, uh, obviously. Uh, and Francis Crick wrote about this in 1984. One of his ideas was that, well, you might form some kind of aggregate locally, and that aggregate then could be very stable and last for a long time. So this uh, idea was taken up by uh, Peter Tompas. He's uh, remarked upon this. And then in a, an experimental way, also by uh, Eric Kandel and Susan Lindquist, the late Lu Susan Lindquist. And they actually identified a particular protein uh, that could uh, form this aggregate uh, uh, because they discovered that an aggregate that's a sort of amyloid-like aggregate of a protein called CPEB, which uh, is in this snail that I alluded to very early, uh, uh, does form aggregates once you've uh, 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 turned on, uh, for enough time anyway, uh, the activity in a dendritic spine. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what's interesting is this is not so, one of these uh, bad aggregates that uh, causes you to lose your memory. This is the aggregate that if it doesn't form, uh, you discover that the uh, snail doesn't remember uh, the connection between uh, a weird uh, chemical signal and the fact you're going to do something bad to it in a moment later. Um, so, uh, so they've done quite a lot of work on this uh, system. And it's in this functional form that, uh, that's in the prionic form in which it actually carries out the function of uh, uh, affecting the uh, uh, translation of other proteins, one of which turns out to be actin. So anyway, we uh, uh, started on this actually through a starter project when Ming Chen first joined my group. I often give people some interesting protein uh, folding problem just to see if they can run the software. Um, and uh, I pick something that's amusing in some other way uh, that also I won't be disappointed if they fail to make much progress. But in this case, Ming Chen uh, found that this uh, segment that was involved in the aggregation uh, formed very nice structures. They form, in fact, helical coils. Uh, this was also uh, consistent with the observations of Kendall and Lindquist. And of course, it forms helical coils, which then coil up. Um, but those are not the prion. Those are not uh, the amyloid, as you can see. So that might be a kind of, uh, that might seem like a negative result. But um, Ming Chen, of course, uh, thought about this. It's something that's, uh, what, once somebody's thought it up, you realize it's obvious, but it was an, I was really uh, amazed when he first pointed this out. Uh, that of course, if you take a helical thing and stretch it, it now becomes beta-like. Uh, by being beta-like then, it means a helical coil, if you stretch on it, pull on it, it will turn into something that might be uh, an amyloid. So, uh, so uh, the, the picture then is that if you could pull on this thing, uh, you could, uh, cause it to uh, uh, straighten out and then form an amyloid. So this is something that we call the mechanical prion. And the, we can measure the amount of force you would need to do this. It's not terribly large because the amyloid itself is quite stable. Uh, and uh, it turns out the amounts of force that you need are similar to the amounts of force that actin networks can uh, exert on, uh, on molecules. And, uh, uh, and in fact, it's known, it was already known that the CPEB co-localizes with the actin cytoskeleton. So this gave us a mechanism in which we uh, uh, normally uh, have an actin uh, uh, network, perhaps with the chem kinase. Uh, when it gets activated, it uh, uh, changes its structure if it has some CPEBs already bound to it, it can pull on those CPEBs. If you have multiple CPEBs, they can form a prion. And now you have a much harder time going back because that prion is so stable uh, compared to these uh, uh, other objects. Now, what's interesting is, again, the loop can be closed because it's the prionic form of the CPEB, which, uh, which uh, then um, uh, allows actin's mRNA to be um, to be uh, uh, processed and give you more actin. So there's kind of a combination of two mechanisms that Crick thought of. One is a closed cycle of some sort of uh, 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 mutually reinforcing processes. 
and the other being uh, the formation of an aggregate in this scenario. One of the projects that I won't have time to talk to you about, but that we've uh, published uh, recently, uh, a project that Nick Schaefer took a big lead in and the student Shinyu Gu has uh, done her really great uh, first work on, is about how CPEB also binds to actin. The study is somewhat parallel to what went on for the uh, uh, for the uh, CAM kinase, except it's been a much harder project uh, because it's so hard to work with uh, CPEB uh, in the laboratory with our collaborator, uh, Neil uh, Waxham. Well, uh, we've seen that aggregation enters into memory. And of course, a lot of these uh, diseases that uh, have attracted protein scientists to aggregation involve neurological symptoms. Of course, this may be partly just because, you know, that's where we notice stuff. Uh, you know, other things are more subtle. Uh, you know, if your, if your leg muscles are a little weak, you don't immediately start worrying about it. Uh, of course, you know, there are diseases that aren't brain related that involve aggregation as well. Um, but, um, but it's amazing how many aggregation diseases there are that involve amyloids. And, and I think that this uh, connection to sort of functional amyloid formation is a really intriguing one. And the idea that amyloid formation is, uh, can be seeded by other um, uh, proteins and uh, might be involved in function is quite important. Now I'm going to tell you, we've been working about this a uh, few years then, uh, uh, starting with the uh, aggregation of amyloid beta. We've done quite a lot of work on amyloid beta. Uh, of course, you know that the tau repeat proteins are also a famous uh, uh, culprit, possibly in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, or, uh, new student Shun Chen, ah, sorry, yeah, and uh, and and so on. But I'm going to talk about another really, I would say, beautiful physical chemical uh, example, and in a way beautiful, but sad in another way, uh, example of aggregation. And this is in the aggregation of Huntington's disease. Um, Huntington's disease uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a terrible disease. It usually uh, strikes people at an older age. Uh, uh, the person who, uh, and it involves a, a, what, would be, what would seem to be a very, very simple uh, polypeptide. Uh, polypeptide that involves repeating uh, uh, polyglutamine. Uh, and the way this forms is that you actually have the, the uh, trinucle trinucleotide that, um, uh, that uh, codes for polyglutamine in a certain protein called Huntington. Uh, sometimes uh, in passing down from one generation to the next, that nucleotide repeat gets stuttered over and you get a longer repeat. So some people, most people have short repeats, but some people sadly have long repeats. That means you have a longer polyglutamine. And as it turns out, those people are the ones who, who uh, suffer from Huntington's disease. The person who discovered this is Nancy Wexler, who's shown here. I had the pleasure of serving with her on several committees for several years. She's a very delightful person. She's also very, very smart. Uh, it turns out her father was, uh, had, was, uh, had Huntington's disease, also was, uh, which of course makes her uh, susceptible. And uh, she, uh, 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 and also he was very uh, wealthy. So uh, with his wealth and her um, uh, drive and intelligence, uh, they, uh, uh, she was able to actually identify this uh, Huntington gene and uh, uh, many years ago. And it's how we know that uh, this is uh, essentially the cause of the disease somehow. It's an, why I call this sort of physical chemical disease. I think that's a word that I first heard from uh, Bill Eaton when, I, when we listened to Max Perutz talk about Huntington's disease uh, 25, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, Bill Eaton said it's clearly a physical chemical disease. Um, uh, is this graph. Um, and uh, uh, what you see is that the length of the repeat determines the age of onset. Uh, people with, uh, many of us have repeats, you know, up to around 40, you know, we might get hunting disease, but only when we're 100 or something like that. Uh, but then once you get to length 40, you start to get the disease. If you get longer and longer and longer repeats, 
And actually one of the ways in which it was found were these people in uh, Venezuela, a whole village of people there have very, very long repeats. Uh, and uh, they get it at a very, very sadly early age. Um, so this is a disease which is caused by polymer physics. Uh, the inclusion bodies uh, that inclusion bodies form, and these are again the hallmark uh, of the disease. Uh, of course, we know that uh, it might be other um, uh, you know oligomers that are causing problems, but we know that people who really have the disease definitely have these aggregates. Now, uh, again, when we look at this very simple system of poly Q, what was interesting is that it normally forms a rather disordered, somewhat, you know, uh, uh, helical, uh, but really more disordered, uh, slightly beta-like uh, entity. And that's what happens when it's short. But when the sequence gets long, it has a tendency to fold back on itself and form nice hydrogen bonds. And you can see that that's something that will be favored the longer the chain is because you can, uh, uh, once you start zipping things up, the entropy loss that you have for completing the zipper uh, goes down. So this is at least what the uh, awesome Hamiltonian uh, says is the free energy profile of uh, forming contacts in different length oligomers. You can see at a temperature of around uh, 300 or so, um, uh, you, you, you uh, have a tendency to form this uh, uh, beta, uh, beta strand, uh, not beta strand, but yeah, I guess beta strand uh, 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 object. Actually, this has been studied by many people also in the laboratory. Ronald Wetzel is one of the key guys who's done this. Uh, he uh, shows that uh, you have to solubilize this in the first place. You can put a few things at the end in order to do that. Uh, and then what he shows is that as you get to longer um, uh, 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 strands, uh, the nucleation kinetics gets typically faster, uh, solubility goes down, and the, um, and the nuclearity of the nucleation event uh, gets smaller. So we then just go ahead, uh, because we have a coarse grain model, we can put lots of cues together. And what we see is that if we have uh, uh, something of length 20, most of the things on their own are extended objects. Some of them form the, uh, uh, the, uh, the loops. Uh, uh, and then once they form loops, those that have loops sometimes come together and then finally complete the aggregation. This is actually obviously at a very high concentration, so we can see this uh, at all. Now, uh, it's nice to make movies, uh, but one of the things that uh, I think we've taken over from our studying protein folding as a statistical mechanics problem is to turn these things into numbers. And you can do that also with coarse grain models because you can, uh, you can uh, sample things for very long times and study fairly large systems. This is much harder to do in all atom simulation. But when we do this for a given concentration, we can actually find the free energy profile that I'll call it the, the concentration within a box. Uh, of course, what happens is as you aggregate within a box, you change the concentration. And so you have to correct for this, the fact that the concentrations are changing. You can do that with physical cluster theory. And, uh, <coughs> um, and actually this is something that allowed us to change from sort of gee whiz simulations into quantitative analysis. And uh, we did this in the A beta cases. And uh, what you see here is now at fixed concentrations, what the free energy profiles look like as a function of oligomer size. And basically trying to find the place where this finally starts to go downhill, that's what determines the uh, critical concentration. The uh, size of the unit that's involved in uh, nucleating uh, also uh, is determined by where the sort of transition state is roughly in this. Of course, the, 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 these are not always very simple transition state theory-like uh, uh, cases, but at least gives you an idea of what the nucleus size uh, would be. Now, what happens when you go longer? Well, when you go longer, many more of these have already given up a big part of their entropy to become you know, uh, clo closed loops. Uh, they are now much more rigid 
because they're more rigid, they have much less entropy to give up when you bring them together. And so these guys that have more of a tendency to dimerize obviously also become less soluble. And you can see that this happened much faster than in the other new paper. Now, that's the pure poly Q. What happens in Huntington itself? Well, you can see that the whole Huntington, which probably does all kinds of things, we don't know what they do. We don't know what Huntington does, um, or at least I don't know what Huntington does uh, uh, when it's normally there. It must be doing something, at least at some stage of development, because mice without it have trouble. Um, well, they, they die in utero. You completely get rid of it. Um, and um, uh, But its function is not so clear. It has actually several parts uh, that are, as we say, quite interesting out here, which we don't know their structure. Uh, we have some ideas of the structures right around the poly Q. We have a part that's N-terminal. It's had its crystal structure for uh, solved. It's alpha helix-like. There's also a part that involves lots of polyprolines, uh, <clears throat> which is, uh, uh, this is thought to be involved in preventing the aggregation um, in the poly Q, and maybe by first stopping the formation of the helix in the first case. So uh, we can study uh, these even larger systems this way. So for example, we can now put the N-terminal fragment on. Um, and uh, when we put the N-terminal fragment on, uh, the, uh, we can calculate a, a free energy profile now as a function of oligomer size, as well as the fraction of side chain hydrogen bonds, which is telling you how beta-like things are. And what we see is that uh, putting on the N-terminal fragment creates these uh, helical bundles, which actually make it easier to fold, uh, uh, to, to nucleate uh, uh, fibrillar um, uh, assemblies. On the other hand, the polyproline uh, itself uh, prevents that formation of the helices in the first place, even in the poly Q fragment. And so it makes it more uphill and harder to aggregate. Overall, the aggregation mechanism is what we saw in the movies uh, for the pure poly Q. And we can now estimate, because we can do things quantitatively, the, uh, uh, the critical length at the concentration that we have in inclusion bodies. And interestingly, it comes out to be somewhere between 30 and 40. Uh, so uh, this would explain all this thing together, gives a good estimate of the length where you're going to have problems. Uh, uh, with aggregation. So I think I'll stop there. Um, uh, there's of course much more to say, and you can see that this is really uh, just the beginning of, a, of an exploratory adventure. Uh, I think that our understanding of protein folding and dynamics has given us quantitative tools to see how proteins uh, form, how they form aggregates, and uh, now we, uh, one of the things, of course, there's still many questions about that, uh, but, but our even current understanding lets us try to see where these processes of forming higher uh, organized objects, as well as aggregates, enter into systems biology of uh, the formation of uh, memory. Uh, so I'll stop there and again mention uh, that, that I got started in this through the starter project of Ming Chen. Uh, 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 Margaret Chung was already working on Calmodulin and Cam Kinase with Neil Waxham. Uh, we joined together on this. Uh, Nick Schaefer and uh, Chan Wang are, were deeply involved in this problem. And as I said, the CPEB interaction with Acton is something that uh, uh, we've uh, been able to make progress on. I think our PNAS on that will come out in a few weeks, we haven't gotten the uh, galley proofs yet. And this overall problem of how it interacts with the formation of aggregation structures, the genetic spine is really an interesting problem in soft condensed matter that Herb Levine has been involved with. And our funding for this project uh, is of course from the NSF RAISE uh, uh, grant. Uh, our center has also supported many aspects of these uh, theories over time. That's also uh, paid for by the NSF. And uh, some of the early aggregation, uh, of course, folding work was supported by the, the NIH. Um, 
So with that, I think I can take questions. Uh, I have a ton of backup slides, but I think I'll uh, uh, just go through them um, so I can exit this um, and stop sharing, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, for this beautiful talk and these exciting connections between protein folding and dynamics and all kinds of processes in the brain. I'm, I'm very happy there are people actually there. I, this is so weird an experience. I realized about 15 minutes in, I had no idea whether I was just giving a seminar to myself, but so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, well, there are about 200 people watching. So. Okay, okay, so somebody heard it. Okay, good. So, so let's have a look at uh, the questions. So the first question is from Demon Ray. So if you please unmute yourself and then you can ask the question yourself. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Professor Rubin. This was a very uh, interesting lecture. Uh, so my question is when you discussed about the, uh, the binding of the CAMK2 with the actin, Yes. Uh, so I have like two questions on that. So one of them is what are the kind of uh, molecular forces which are responsible for that binding? And uh, also like, is it specific to only actin or can it bind to something else as well? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. And, um, uh, and, and I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm it's very good, and I have to apologize for not being able to answer it very well. Uh, uh, I don't uh, recall, uh, you know, studying very carefully the the interface uh, to see, you know, say what which sort of uh, interactions are there. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know which specific hydrogen bonds are formed whether it's a wet interface and so on. We used our frustration analysis. My recollection was that the frustration analysis showed a fairly, certainly in the camp kind of uh, structural part, the binding was not uh, frustrated at all. Uh, and I'm not sure whether there, the, in the other case, there were some uh, residual frustration in it. But this goes back to a, an old um, uh, you know, bugaboo we, in these water media interactions, which are clearly crucial there's a lot of interesting things you can ask about how they, how they form. Uh, they seem to involve things like the same water molecule being able to um, uh, bind to two charge groups at the same time. Uh, when we first uh, came up with these things um, uh, years ago when Garrick discovered them, uh, we put off the problem of trying to figure out uh, how long they would um, you know, uh, what, what, their, what their basic uh, physical origin was. We had some thoughts about it. I guess I thought someone would go in and uh, look at that more carefully over the years, but I never got anyone in the group to do that. Um, uh, so I can't ca tell you much more about it. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Next question is from Garrick the Boyan. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Garrick can, yeah. Peter, I'm just going to ask you a question. I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, um, I, uh, I, I want to ask you a question about the CPAP part of the story. Yes. You, you, you made such an interest, such, such a convincing case about how these long-term memories form. Then it sort of raises a question, how do they decay then? If, if these prions form then, like you know with prions they have, they, they potentially might have very long time scales and so on. So do you think there's an active mechanism that erases memories? Um, um, well, first of all, I think we know that there are lots of actin, uh, active mechanisms that erase memories um, uh, I, from my general reading in neurobiology. Um, uh, but, um, but I don't know all the, the system biologies or proteins involved in them. It's also not clear to me whether you have basically, you know, the, the scenario that that I presented of, uh, you know, you have CAM kinase, it does this, as soon as that's done, it immediately starts forming prions uh, by the mechanical action. That was oversimplified. There may be several more layers of uh, actin rearrangement systems biology in there, uh, that each one of which could be regulatable. Uh, so I think the, the uh, uh, 
the answer is that 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 you know I I think there are such active mechanisms, and act and I guess it is certainly in the case of the prion, it would be interesting to uh, uh, to 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 get at those. You know, one of the problems in all of this is um, uh, you know. Uh, 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 to study memory, you have to study, you know, kind of animals, really. Uh, it's hard to do it at the cellular scale. Um, one of the big things that Nick Schaefer is uh, visualizing doing in his uh, uh, planned research, in fact, is to try to do more of this in yeast, to do all these studies in yeast, uh, which, you know, we don't care when we throw yeast out the drain uh, as much as, you know, if we kill mice. Uh, but but uh, getting uh, one of the things that I think makes all this long-term memory stuff hard to study is you have to wait a long time to study the individual cases. So it's a little hard to keep the mice alive. Um, as I understand it, keeping 10 mice alive a day uh, costs about the same as staying at a hotel. So it's very expensive um, <laughs> uh, to keep them there for for a long time, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe CPAP then, maybe there are multiple memory timescales actually, and CPAP is the very long timescale memory formation. Very likely, very likely, yeah. Although, you know, how long the memories are in the sea snail uh, is a little, um, a little um, uh, un, un, uh, obviously they're not studying the very long-term memory there. They're studying only a few days. Um, Okay. I know this is very weird for these talks, but I wonder if I could be excused for like one minute. I will be back. Form your questions. Hold on. Yeah, so if you have more questions, uh, please mention them in the chat and I will call you up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm very, I apologize to everyone. <laughs> just, uh, just a little bit of a biological necessity there. Okay. Um, okay, so next question is from Taras Pogorelov. Uh, okay, hi, Peter, thank you for the inspirational you. talk. Yes, good to see you. How are things, are you in Urbana? Yes, I'm in Urbana, and I'm actually inside of a coli cell, actually, as you can see. So oh, OK, very nice. Yeah, say drunk. hello to Zan. Nice I to will, you. absolutely. And Martin, I think, is listening. In and Martin, two. yes. Um, a question related to uh, um, aggregates that are functional versus not functional, detrimental aggregates. Do you think we will discover, or if there are any physical, chemical differences between functional and uh, not functional aggregates? Or you think it's the same principles that are driving this? I think we have to look in. I, I, I well, obviously, at some level, it will be the same principles, of course, the uh, same forces. Uh, I think the same sort of uh, energy landscape tools for analyzing free energy profiles are useful both for functional prions and for dysfunctional prions. Um, uh, I, um, uh, I, I uh, you know, don't, uh, when we come to the aggregates that are dysfunctional, 
uh, uh, we, uh, there's still, of course, the big question of is it the oligomers versus which may or not be fibro-like, or are they the, the final fibers? I think there's definitely lots of views on that. Um, uh, Chris Dobson uh, used to uh, you know, really point his finger at the oligomers. Um, but I would say that the story is very open. Uh, it's clear these things uh, interact. So for example, the, uh, the tau protein and the amyloid beta protein are uh, uh, both thought of as uh, candidates in Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, people even send me papers on, uh, or not, uh, they, they, they cite our work in the journals on stroke, because of course it could be just as simple as you block the capillaries, like in hemoglobin uh, S uh, nucleation. Uh, so, um, uh, so it could be very simple and mechanical in the end. Um, I think though it's, a, it's peculiar that there's so many things that inform aggregates involved in the neurobiology. I think there are many places where they could be interacting with each other and there could be multiple things. So it may not be easy to say, this is a functional one, this is a dysfunctional one. Maybe they're all uh, involved in a common uh, purpose um, uh, and something subtle uh, goes, uh, goes, goes wrong. So I don't think there's gonna be a simple dif difference. I think this question is a question of systems biology rather than pure uh, physics or chemistry. Okay, so the next question is from Rafael Petrosian. Hi, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned that the memory could be formed, uh, stored with uh, aggregation of proteins. So how much memory could be stored with that mechanism and for how long? And is there uh, evidence of memory formation with that mechanism in any, any living system? Well, the last thing is the, the work of Kandel and Lindquist who've, and others uh, who've, who've sort of shown that the aggregates, if they don't form in the case of CPEB in these snails and in Drosophila and several other systems, they don't form memories. So in terms of the sort of qualitative answer, we have one example of the aggregates uh, seemingly being required in, in all of this. Uh, the, the first two questions you have are really great. Uh, I've tried to think, is there some easy, like, you know, physics-y style way of estimating numbers uh, here? Uh, and I haven't come up with it. That doesn't mean it's impossible. I haven't tried very hard. I've only tried modestly hard, uh, but it seems to me it's a great question. Obviously, storing things in the dendritic spines, as opposed to, let's say, in the whole neuron. Most people talk about neurobiology, they think of the whole neuron as storing, uh, you know, uh, Neural theorists often talk about the things being a, a neuron storing information. Storing it in a dendritic spine means a much smaller thing can store the information. That always means that you have a larger capacity. But uh, the capacity is, um, uh, how the capacity is related to the number is only known in abstract models. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, in this theory of associative memories, like we used in setting up the energy function, there's a thing called the capacity, which is how many things can you memorize. And if you have only two body interactions, that capacity is proportional to the number of objects. If you have three body interactions, it's proportional to the square. If you have four, it's proportional to the, to the, to the cube and so on. So, so it really depends on how nonlinear the neural network actually is. Um, but you know, it reminds me of the famous joke of the uh, old zoology professor. The old zoology professor goes to the meeting of a uh, first uh, class, uh, not class, but, you know, before school starts, they have a meeting of the new faculty. New faculty member comes up to him and he says, you know, my name is so, so-and-so. And the old guy says, no, sorry, don't tell me your name. If every time I learn a name, I forget a fish. So there's a finite capacity that you have, uh, to, uh, and, and but how how finite it is, I don't think we understand. I see. In Thank real you. systems, yeah. Okay, and the next question is from Ronnie Granick. Hi. Uh, so I actually I have two questions. Uh, I can start by maybe a question a co slash comment. 
that it seems to me that once, let's say if you talk about the binding of uh, uh, K2, I believe that's how you call yeah. it, mm -hmm. to in, uh, once you get from your simulation the binding sites and the energies, uh, binding energies, and even uh, you know, the local uh, rate constants, uh, which involves the local energy barriers, then the, the, the whole question of how you form bundles or networks is really moving to, to soft metaphysics, which is much more efficient on a larger scale. And um, maybe it's not, uh, I, I was not sure if you try to penetrate the, the larger scale by, by the simulations or, or you just uh, limited yourself to the, to the, let's say a few actin monomers and, and uh, uh, well, we don't thing. limit ourselves. I mean, in fact, the, the moving to the larger objects is one of the themes of uh, of the Ray's grant, but also of the uh, uh, of our Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, which uh, I can I think I can announce. I just got the information that <coughs> it is going to be funded for five more years. So that's so we'll have a chance to look at this. But this connection with soft matter is a direction we definitely are going in. Um, uh, you know, uh, the studies that I told you about are at the micro scale. I don't think our, I, I don't think we're going to, uh, whatever, nano scale. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we can push a little bit in the sort of straightforward simulational way. We can do much bigger systems now than we did actually when that study was done uh, through some uh, 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 developments by uh, Wei Lu and my group. Uh, but I don't think we plan to go fully, you know, in that kind of, you know, direction any more than we try to do it by all atom. But there's a variety of intermediate level models we can build once we know the basic local binding. So, for example, Greg Voth has talked about uh, uh, coarse grain models of actin, where actin, each actin monomer is only one or two uh, sites, or maybe, or maybe it's four sites. And we're using a version of that, as well as our information on CAM kinase, uh, where it binds. Uh, Carlos Bueno, who I should have also mentioned, he was on the, uh, uh, several of the papers. Carlos Bueno has been using that model uh, to build up uh, CAM kinase actin interactions. And then um, other people here are using Garrick's uh, median uh, model, which then lets you have the actin itself grow, uh, as well as uh, a, Put in chem kinase. So, so there's a variety of, of uh, intermediate size, uh, still more coarse grain models, which is where, where we're going to go with it. And there are certainly are interesting questions uh, of pure statistical physics about how does your uh, pillow uh, stay in that same shape? This is sort of a problem of marginal stability and is related to jamming and things of that sort. But that's, that's a uh, that's such. That's a, a rather general question that we think a lot about, but uh, we're, we're doing things at all the different scales. Can I ask you another short one? For me, it's fine. I'm 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 here now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, wondering when you first polymerize the actin, how do you include the ATP? Ah, uh, the we take the actin polymerized structure as known. Ah. Now it isn't really. Uh, technically known, it's based on a cryo EM and people putting things into the cryo EM. I think it's probably okay, uh, but but uh, but there are definitely lots of interesting questions about uh, about that. Uh, but we don't try to build up the actin itself at this stage. Uh, but I, there's tons of interesting questions that again I, I, I like that the, the 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 point. You know, one of the things that I I felt a little funny talking about, uh, you know, because this, this conference is, or not conference, this series has been about protein folding and dynamics, but I think people in uh, folding, we've been, we're very, very fascinated with structure prediction. I would say that in some sense, we've done very well in that. Uh, I think we've also done very well in getting new ideas about dynamics, but we haven't done enough about taking the ideas about how protein dynamics relate to function and spreading those around. And you know, everyone who thinks of almost any, stru you know, structural biologists still, many practicing ones think, well, you just have to have the structure of the two different things that are at the beginning, the end of a process, and you know the rest by morphing from one to the other. But I think there's a ton of questions about what goes on in between 
that actually we have the tools to address uh, now, free energy profiling on our side, frustration analysis. I, I wish more experimentalists would, for example, take up five value analysis of all types of functional motions. It's not, uh, I think these ideas that somehow don't quite penetrate to the, to the um, uh, practicing, uh, you know, system biologist or even structural biologist. So I think there's a lot we can work on there in terms of education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so there are several congratulations here on the renewal of your center. Um, well, thank you. That, there's no more questions. Maybe I can ask a final question. Sure. And so I was wondering, I know it's, it's experimentally, it's notoriously hard to measure nucleation sizes for these aggregating systems. And I remember about 20 years ago, Ron Wetzel uh, did some experiments and analysis on Huntington aggregation and found yes. a very small nucleus, maybe even the monomer. But I was wondering whether there's uh, more recent results to compare uh, your simulations to in terms of nucleus sizes. I don't, I, there may be, I, I don't know of them. We compared to the Wetzel and we, you know, of course looked at all the recent reviews of Wetzel and, and, and things. Um, uh, so I think we're somewhat up to date on what we could compare to. But, uh, but admittedly, always these nucleation sizes are quite uh, uh, difficult. In fact, sort of one of the questions is why is it not always two? Uh, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, the natural way we explain nucleation having a finite size um, is usually, uh, in, in, uh, you know, for example, in inorganic chemistry is surface to volume, but there's no such thing in a one dimensional, you know, uh, aggregate. Now you can have things like these hemoglobin S things where you have to turn a couple of turns of a helix or something in the Edelstein structure. Although I'm not actually sure whether the number 32, which Bill always talks about is completely understood there, but maybe if he's listening, he can tell us about why the critical size of 32, if that's understood molecularly, but he's probably. Bill, do you want to comment on this if you are around still? Probably not, yeah, okay. Okay, so then if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you very much again, Peter, for a wonderful talk. I would like to thank all of you for great discussion. And uh, I would like to remind you that in two weeks, we will have Bob Sauer talking about protein recognition unfolding and translocation by CLIPXP protease. So thanks again for joining all of you. Have a good week. Good. And I hope Thank to you. see you again in two weeks. All the best. Good. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.